Okay, so from today I will start uh, lectures on redistribution mechanisms. Okay, so it will take about uh, three to three and a half lectures. So. Okay, so redistribution is uh, uh, a, a fundamental objective in mechanism design and uh, what we learned from last few lectures is that uh, if the designer is a seller who is interested in maximizing expected revenue, then we can say that uh, there are certain kinds of mechanisms that we have a very good idea about and these things maximizing uh, maximize expected revenue. Redistribution is fundamentally different from that. So, uh, so in the redistribution uh, settings, uh, the mechanism designer is someone like a utilitarian designer, like a government. Uh, so, or it may be a setting without any mechanism designer. So, basically, a group of agents are getting together and trying to figure out how to allocate an object. Okay. So uh, examples, uh, two examples here I have given. One is uh, uh, a bequest without a will. So uh, suppose uh, there is a bequest and there are many claimants to the bequest and there is no uh, will. So the, so the law cannot say anything. So we need to des uh, design a procedure. The agents themselves will have to design the claimants in this case will have to design a mechanism where they will figure out how to uh, allocate the object. That's uh, one example. The other example is uh, uh, like a land which is uh, acquired by the government and needs to be reallocated. Okay, so the government needs to uh, acquire a land and needs to be reallocated. So there are many parties who are interested in this land and uh, so who should it be given to and what kind of uh, uh, you know compensation or prices should be charged and so on so in this case uh, basically the government's objective is not necessarily to maximize uh, expected revenue but to basically a utilitarian objective which is to maximize the sum of utilities of the agent, so maximize the sum of expected utilities of the agent. Okay, so uh, so we'll see that uh, how some of these examples can be handled by what we will learn in these lectures. In the last one or two lectures, we did was we have some problem and we extract the maximum possible value. Yes. And we redistribute it among the agents. So how that is different from this model? We, are we did not redistribute. So in the last few lectures, what we were doing is we were just extracting as much surplus as possible. So here the problem is the other one where we want to basically give as much as possible to the agents. Okay. Okay. So... Uh, Right, so there basically, as you saw, for instance, in Kramer McLean, uh, the designer was able to extract in expectation everything that was there on the table. Okay, here, what we, we, you want to do is whatever is there on the table, you just want to give it to the agents. Okay, that's basically the objective. Uh, so, what is going to be different? Well, uh, for starters, incentive and participation constraints are going to remain. So, in, in most of the mechanism design problems that we will see, the incentive and participation constraints are going to remain the same. Uh, but there will be some additional constraints or the nature of these incentive and participation constraints are going to change. So, here in this problem also, the incentive and participation constraints are going to remain, but there are going to be new constraints on payments and payoffs. So for instance, uh, we'll impose that uh, uh, sum of payments is equal to zero or non-negative, okay? So this is kind of a, uh, uh, 
setting where uh, the first one makes sense in settings where basically uh, there is no designer so whatever the agent decide among themselves to be payments they should just pay each other okay there should not be any money left on the table because uh, there is no one uh, left besides the agent to take the money on the table or give it extra money to the agent so sum of payments is equal to zero the non negativity of sum of payments basically means that uh, even if there is a designer he has no means to finance the agent so basically he can receive some payments but uh, he cannot uh, have uh, uh, you know uh, he cannot be making payment so these kind of new restrictions may come up uh, uh, in the lectures and i'll talk about it so in redistribution framework these kind of uh, constraints may make sense another important difference that you will see from the earlier lectures is that uh, agents will have property rights on the object and uh, i'll be more precise about what property right means and what uh, what role it will play but essentially uh, it will change the nature of the individual rationality constraint the participation constraints are going to look slightly different okay so that's uh, another major change that you will see okay so so these new constraints or modification of constraints uh, what it will do is it will restrict the class of mechanisms severely okay so uh, so what you will see is that uh, uh, in many parts of the lecture you will encounter impossibility results but uh, every impossibility result is uh, you know is an inspiration to do further research to uh, relax those constraints or find new new ways in which uh, possibilities can occur and that's what you will see also so the main paper that we will talk about is uh, this paper by crampton gibbons and clemper in 1987 uh, it's called dissolving a partnership efficiently and and you'll see uh, what exactly how exactly that fits into the screen okay so the model is uh, the following there are n agents and there is a single divisible object to be allocated to n okay so this is a slight departure from the earlier model where uh, you know uh, uh, the object was supposed to be indivisible but here we're going to assume that the object is divisible if you don't like that aspect you can still treat uh, the object to be indivisible but then the uh, you know the qi the quantity allocated to an agent would basically denote the probability with which the indivisible object is allocated to an agent okay so that's uh, basically the interpretation so you can either have a divisible interpretation or an indivisible interpretation but let's uh, for uh, you know consistency let's stick to this divisible interpretation there is a single divisible object to be allocated to any agent each agent i has a per unit value vi for the entire object okay so basically if you give me the entire object i get uh, the value vi and if you give me only qi portion of the object the qi is between 0 and 1 i get vi times qi as the value okay so uh, things become complicated if this is not a linear form like this vi times qi um, so uh, you know the analysis becomes really messy and not much is known what will happen if you relax this uh, linearity constraint okay but uh, for these lectures and crampton gibbons clemper assume that the value by getting qi portion of the object is vi times qi so uh, sir if the valuations vi are quite similar for the agents it may be possible that the mutually beneficial trade is not possible is not possible yeah 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 that's true so yes uh, right so we are going to uh, assume that uh, okay i have 
Yeah, I will come to it. Uh, but we are going to assume that uh, each bi lies in some interval zero beta, and there's some distribution for it, and so on and so forth. So potentially, uh, the model uh, in terms of values is very similar to Myerson's. You know, so uh, each agent uh, draws his uh, value from a particular dis uh, interval uh, using some distribution and so on. Yeah, so as I was saying, there, there is going to be property rights in this model. So basically, the way to, we should think about it is each agent owns a share Ri of the object. So, so think of the land basically. And so uh, the land is initially uh, somebody's property or a group of agents property. So different people own different share of the land. And basically the government wants to acquire it. There might be also some people who own uh, no share of the firm, so uh, of the object. So the share of uh, uh, a private firm might be zero in that land, but uh, that private firm may still be interested in the object. Okay, so the so we are going to assume that uh, the property rights sum to one. This is not a uh, you know major restriction. We can also work with the case that sum of rj's is less than or equal to one that's also it can be easily handled in this uh, model but for simplicity we're going to assume that sum of rj is equal to one okay so uh, of course the result uh, uh, is at least most of the results will apply even if for instance nobody owns any property rights of the object in that case uh, you you can pretty much think that everybody has a one over n share of the object and the results will again go through. So for the moment, let's assume that uh, all the sum of Ri's is equal to one. Uh, we can come back and see where we are using the sum of Ri equal to one property. Okay, so the property right, as I said, will play an important role in defining participation constraint because uh, everybody owns this Ri portion of the object and hence enjoys a value of ri times bi right so their expected value from this uh, object uh, before anything happens is basically ri times bi so unless you give them from the mechanism that much of utility they're not going to participate in the mechanism so the property rights will play an important role in defining participation constraints So the interpretation given in the paper is the following. So they, that's why they call it a partnership dissolution. So the idea is N agents are deciding to for, form a partnership to start a firm, let's say, okay? And each agent is given some share of the firm. Okay, so this is usually the case that uh, when you form a partnership, you're given some share of the partnership, okay? But also, uh, it's uh, uh, legally, uh, uh, you know, uh, before the start of the partnership, when you go to register your firm, there's a legal requirement that you write down a, what is called a dissolution clause. So what's a dissolution clause? Well, it's like a mechanism. It's exactly a mechanism. It specifies uh, who will own the firm and how the shareholders will be compensated if the firm is dissolved. So if the firm is dissolved, that is the partnership is dissolved, then how will the shareholders be compensated and who will own the firm in that case? Okay, so this is uh, basically uh, specified in, in that dissolution clause and that's what is a mechanism in this case. So uh, if the firm is dissolved over here, then what does it mean to say that who will own the firm? After the resolution, uh, what it means is if it is dissolved, then the uh, so the term dissolved here means that the uh, firm is given to somebody. Okay, the entire share of the firm is given to somebody. Okay. Okay. So whatever the value of the firm is at that point, you know, you realize the value of the firm, and then it's up to you what you do to that firm. Okay. okay. 
So th this person who receives the uh, form, uh, he or she need not be, uh, you know, someone who has a RI greater than zero. It can be someone who has RI equal to zero also. Okay. So that's why we allow uh, for the fact that there are some agents who have RI equal to zero. Okay. So these kind, uh, these can be like some uh, outside firm who is trying to take over and stuff like that. Okay. So, uh, so potentially, you know, the dissolution clause can say that, uh, uh, you know, in case uh, the firm is dissolved, then we will hold an open auction where anyone can participate, including those who have RI equal to zero, and the uh, uh, firm will be transferred to the agent uh, who makes the highest uh, offer or something like that, right? So we can specify something like that. So what does, uh, as the title of the paper says, uh, dissolving a partnership efficiently. So what does efficient dissolution of a partnership mean? Well, efficient dissolution requires two things. Well, first, when dissolved, firm should go to the agent who has the highest value for the firm, okay? So the entire firm must go to one agent and that agent must have the highest value. So that's what uh, the requirement of uh, Pareto efficiency uh, is. And the second requirement is entire surplus needs to be redistributed. Uh, yeah. So can you explain the meaning of dissolve? Like I'm not completely understanding what dissolve means. Uh, so uh, one way to think about it is like, uh, we have this property rights now, different RIs. And when you dissolve, there's only one agent who will be given the entire property right. Okay, so dissolving just means that the uh, uh, existing property rights structure no longer continues to hold. Uh, okay, sir. Okay. So the property rights are transferred to someone. Okay, and basically this efficiency requires that this property right transfers happen in an efficient way, which means that uh, the firm, uh, so, Essentially, what we're saying is like in, uh, uh, currently when different people have different shares of the firm, it's inefficient because uh, ideally whoever has the highest share should own the entire firm. And uh, for some reason or the other, we decided not to do that. And now basically when we dissolve it, we should uh, basically give the entire firm to this highest value trade. That's what efficiency requires. And uh, the second uh, objective is that uh, the entire surplus has to be redistributed. So there is, uh, you know, the uh, uh, this idea that uh, uh, we can't generate any surplus or any any money on the table, or there is no one to pump money into the system. Uh, in this whole redistribution process, whatever money is generated. Need is, needs to be redistributed amongst the agents. So that's basically the budget balance requirement. So another way to think about this is that uh, when we dissolve the firm, we generate the maximum possible surplus and basically we redistribute that entire surplus amongst the agents. Okay, so uh, in some sense, this is kind of uh, trying to do an, uh, you know, a utilitarian uh, objective uh, that uh, at every state, uh, the highest valued agent must get the object and the entire surplus, uh, you, you know, should be redistributed amongst the agents only, okay? So, uh, of course, uh, if we do a victory auction, for instance, we do allocate the object to the highest valued agent, but uh, some of that surplus, which is the highest valued agent's uh, value, uh, is is uh, wasted because the that agent pays second highest value, which is taken by the seller. Okay, so here we don't want such things. We want uh, the complete redistribution of that surplus. Okay, uh, so the, so these are the two uh, requirements of an efficient dissolution of a partnership. Okay, sir, who are the agents in the? 
who are the agents so in in this example it will be the uh, all the agents who are interested to own the firm okay so those might be existing shareholders and uh, uh, new uh, uh, firms that are interested to acquire it and so on but the surplus has to be distributed among the existing partners only no no not necessary not necessary okay so as i said uh, you know the agents uh, are i equal to 0 uh, if we decide to uh, uh, you know be uh, include them in the dissolution process we can include uh, agents who don't own any uh, share of the firm but still we can award them if they have very high value for the firm. But the requirement is uh, whatever value they generate, uh, you know, we have to redistribute it amongst everyone. Okay. Right. So, so that's uh, basically the, uh, the objective of efficient uh, dissolution. Uh, what if, uh one of the partners is not interested in buying. Uh -huh. So uh, will he not get any share from the uh, selling of the firm? So what do you mean not interested in buying? So as you are saying that the agents are only the uh, people who are interested in buying the firm. Yeah. But okay. if there is some of... Uh, what I mean is, uh, if an agent is, uh, uh, you know, holds positive share of the firm, then he is automatically included uh, to be a participating agent in the dissolution process. Uh, what, when I when I said that anyone interested in participating in taking over the firm or something, what I meant is, even if you have R I equal to zero, if you have uh, interest in uh, acquiring the firm then you may be included in the dissolution process okay mm -hmm. so uh, by definition if, even if you uh, uh, you know so basically yeah, if, if you own positive share of the firm basically uh, uh, you would like to be compensated some amount because uh, you're deriving some value from the partnership and basically, if your value is very high, then efficiency at least requires that you should own the entire firm. Okay. So, if your value is the highest amongst everyone. So, uh, so in some sense, uh, basically, uh, agents are here trying to maximize their payoff. Okay. So, the, uh, you know, they would acquire the firm if it, uh, uh, so, um, first, they would need to be compensated by the utility that they are in, getting currently from their property rights. And on top of that, they want to get as much uh, payoff from the dissolution process as possible. So besides uh, this uh, dissolution requirement, uh, we will ha have the usual IC and IR constraints. So IC will be Bayesian incentive compatibility and IR will be interim individual rationality and here with respect to the existing property rights. And uh, maybe in the next lecture, I'll, I'll tell you the implications of uh, strengthening these IC and IR constraints and how things will change with that. Okay, so the main question is like, what property rights structure admits an efficient dissolution of the partnership? Okay, so, uh, is this too much to ask, for instance, like, uh, you know, we uh, dissolve, you know, we basically generate the highest possible value as the surplus and redistribute everything amongst the agent in an incentive compatible and individually rational way. Is it ever going to be possible? Okay, so that's basically uh, the question and at least the mechanisms that we know so far they can't do such things and so that's why the question is is there a property right structure which admits efficient dissolution of this partnership okay 
So maybe in certain property right structures, you can do this and maybe in some others, we can't. Okay. So more precisely, what we're looking for is what are the properties of this property right structure so that there exists an efficient Bayesian incentive compatible interim individually rational and budget balance mechanism. Okay. So existence of such a mechanism is like a uh, you know, utopian world for the mechanism designer, especially if it is a, uh, you know, social planner or government or uh, something like that, because, uh, you know, many times you would like uh, to do the efficient thing, which is to allocate the object to the highest valued agent. But at the same time, you'd like to take that uh, surplus that you're generating and redistribute it in the economy in an incentive compatible and individually rational manner okay so uh, so then the question is uh, if we can't do it for every possible property right structure then what kind of property right structures will allow us to do it so that's basically the question and uh, in the process we are also going to see that if we are able to achieve this objective then what kind of mechanisms can dissolve such dissolvable partnerships okay so if we can efficiently dissolve such partnership, then what kind of mechanisms are required? And we'll, we'll say something about that. Too. So uh, solution, uh, so the paper and the talk here will also assume that agents are symmetric ex ante, which means that uh, all the agents are drawing their values from the same support, which will be an interval zero beta, like in the Myerson case, but the intervals are all going to be the same. And the values will be drawn independently using the same distribution F. Okay, so F is this common distribution using which agents are going to draw their values from the interval zero beta, okay? So this will be a major restriction of the paper that uh, agents are going to be symmetric, at least in terms of how they draw their values. Of course, they will be asymmetric in terms of property rights. So different agents might be owning different shares of the firm, uh, but all the agents who are participating in the partnership, they are symmetric ex ante, at least in terms of the values, the way they are drawing exposed uh, i mean after they realize their values different agents will have different values that's possible uh, but uh, they draw their values exactly from the same distribution independently from the same support okay so uh, uh, i'll i'll have more to say about uh, um, uh, what happens if agents are also asymmetric uh, in terms of value uh, but at this point it's important uh, to, to see the effect of keeping the value symmetry, but allowing for property rights asymmetry, then you will be able to completely understand that whatever results we're getting, uh, we're getting because of the asymmetry in the property rights. Okay, so that's the only driving factor in this model. Okay, so, uh, so the paper basically shows, uh, gives a complete uh, description of this efficiently dissolvable partnership. So basically it uh, answers the question that uh, I posed here completely. It basically tells you, uh, what, if you uh, uh, tell me an R, I can tell you whether it can be dissolved by a, a efficient BIC, IIR and budget balance mechanism. Okay. So it gives so, a complete characterization of that. Yeah. So what exactly do we mean by the property right structure R? So like you can imagine various property, I'll give uh, examples in a minute, but uh, you can re uh, imagine different property right structures. So for instance, uh, uh, think of a three agent partnership. All of them may have equal property rights, one third, one third, one third, right? So share, they own one third of the share of the firm, okay? Or maybe like two of them have half half, and one agent is just uh, you know uh, you know he's just advising or something, and he doesn't own any share of the firm. 
it might be an outside firm which is trying to take over so there are different okay. property rights possible uh, so different uh, scenarios will have different property rights in the land acquisition problem for instance uh, uh, suppose there are farmers who own different parts of the land okay and the government is trying to acquire a big chunk of land in some area different farmers own different shares of the farm, of the land Uh, there is a private company which does not own any part of the land okay so that's a property right structure okay so the question is uh, if i uh, you know different settings have different property right structure so the question is what kind of property right structure so what is this ri distribution so what is the value of r1 to rn uh, so uh, such that it can admit an efficient dissolution of the partnership okay so the paper not only characterizes what all dissolvable uh, you know what all partnerships uh, can be efficiently dissolved but also uh, uh, gives uh, specific mechanisms which can dissolve every dissolvable partnership okay uh, the simple mechanisms which can uh, uh, so the, so the, this mechanism the uh, mechanism that can work for every dissolvable partnership is quite complicated but there are simpler mechanisms which can dissolve some dissolvable partnership but not every thing will is also given in the paper so we'll talk about that so these are the, uh, the takeaways of the model yeah so just one thing have they also proved that uh, the ability to dissolve efficiently depends on, solely on the property right uh yeah so that will be a corollary of their result so basically uh, um, i mean fixing the uh, distributions of the bidders right and uh, um, and basically all this type space structure and so on uh, the property right structure is the only thing that will determine whether a partnership can be dissolved efficiently or not what else did you have in mind there are uh, the allocations as well so the final allocations they are saying it is efficient but the payments and allocations everything yeah but uh, as we know that all these uh, ic and ir constraints will pin those things down right because we want to allocate it efficiently so essentially uh, because we want to allocate efficiently then basically uh, you know the ic and ir constraints will pin down those payments also that we we can make and uh, so uh, so given these constraints the only flexibility we have is to uh, look at different uh, property right structure and for in different property right structures we may be able to achieve these objectives under these constraints Uh, but in other uh, you know uh, property right structure we may not be able okay so the main uh, things that you should remember here is that in an informational symmetric environment so which means that agents are drawing their values identically and independently property rights uh, asymmetric cre will create some impossibility or tension okay and we'll show that symmetric partnerships are easy to dissolve so that is if everybody has equal property rights then we can always dissolve such partnerships okay uh but asymmetric partnerships will create trouble and will Uh, see what kind of uh, asymmetries asymmetric partnerships we create from um, we'll also uh, you know the paper at least will uh, talks about simple mechanisms to dissolve uh, such partnerships uh, so one mechanism that you can imagine is that uh, you know uh, so there is uh, this uh, uh, let's say land so everybody bids including the farmers Uh, or whoever is interested uh, basically uh, 
and whoever bids the highest, that bidder wins and pays his bid amount. Okay. And once we receive its bid, that bid amount is equally distributed among all the bidders. Okay. You can modify this uh, to also say that her bid amount is equally distributed amongst the losing bidders only. Okay. That's also possible. It's clear that uh, such a mechanism, such an auction procedure will not have a dominant strategy equilibrium. So it's uh, very unlikely because uh, uh, basically uh, this uh, you know, redistribution uh, amount is depending on the bid of the winner and so on. So you can show that these things won't be uh, dominant strategy incentive apart from it, but they will be uh, there will be some equilibrium of such mechanism in Bayes Nash equilibrium. Okay, so 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 such mechanisms will be Bayesian incentive compatible, and uh, the crucial thing is, of course, the uh, individual rationality constraint, which is basically, is it possible that uh, agents can be guaranteed their uh, you know ex ante property rights value? which is RI times their value, uh, that much utility by participating in this mechanism. Okay. So what uh, they show in the paper that uh, at least, uh, uh, you know, if the property rights are distributed uh, very symmetrically, then this mechanism can ensure that. But if the property rights structure is too asymmetric, then basically, it's not going to be possible. Okay, that's what uh, the paper will show. So, uh, some of you might be uh, wondering like, uh, what kind of property right structure do we have in mind? Well, here is a uh, um, you know, couple of examples. So, think of a property right structure where one of the agent owns the entire firm and others uh, have zero property rights. Okay. So in this case, the agent who owns the firm uh, would be called a seller, okay? And all the N minus one other agents are the buyers, okay? So this is what I will call a one seller, many buyer model, okay? So suppose there is a seller and he owns an object and now he wants to sell it amongst uh, uh, N minus one buyers, okay? And he also has a value for the object. So basically, if he finds that uh, the buyers don't have high enough value, so efficiency at least will require that uh, the object is only sold if the seller's value is less than one of the buyer's values, right? So that's what efficiency will require. And there is no outside party here. So basically, whatever the buyers pay, will the seller will receive. Okay, so budget balance is required. So in this model, the question is, is there a Bayesian incentive compatible interim individually rational mechanism where trade can take place between the seller and the buyers efficiently? Okay. So trade only takes place if the seller's value is lower than one of the buyer's values. Okay. Otherwise, trade does not take place. Sir, why there is only a single buyer in the last example? I'll come to that. I'll come to that. Okay. So, uh, so at least in the first example, it's basically uh, an extension of the uh, uh, bilateral trading model, where in the bilateral trade, we just had one seller and one buyer. Here we have one seller and many buyers. The seller also has a value for the object. And the goal is here to trade efficiently. That is trade only when the seller's value uh, um, is lower than one of the buyer's values. Uh, but because the good is uh, divisible, uh, multiple uh, buyers can take, take, get fractions of good also, no? They can, but efficiency will say that only one of the buyers will get the good. Uh, okay. Okay. So efficiency in these models, in this uh, quasi-linear models, is basically uh, say, uh, saying that the highest guy gets the entire uh, good. But sir, shouldn't efficiency uh, require that it's 
uh, allocated in a way in which the total surplus is the maximum uh what is that uh, what did you say i am saying shouldn't efficiency require that it should be allocated amongst the people in a way that uh, maximizes the overall surplus like it's divisible so we can distribute it among the agent yeah so I, as we had seen in the early lectures of mechanism design that uh, pareto efficiency with quasi linear preferences is equivalent to maximizing the sum of values of the agents so the sum of values is maximized here by giving the object to the agent who has the highest value okay so that's what pareto efficiency is in this model okay sir so there is a question that uh, uh, question that can value be defined over fraction of land and not the whole yeah so as i said earlier that uh, you know instead of uh, defining value per unit value as the type so here vi is the value for the entire object and then qi times vi is the value for qi fraction of the land we could have a, you know a function vi which is basically giving you what is your value for any fraction of the land okay and it need not be linear so we can define and that function can be like a concave function or whatever uh, but at this point uh, the theory is not advanced enough to uh, you know to figure out the solutions of that at this point we're just going to assume that the value the type is for the entire object and if you get qi then it's qi times vi okay so good so the last example is another uh, so uh, uh, interesting fairly interesting example where basically there is one buyer and many sellers so essentially you can think of this as a as an example where uh, one piece of land is uh, equally owned by n minus 1 farmers okay so here rj equal to 1 over n minus 1 for all j not equal to i and there is a private firm uh, who owns uh, who does not own any part of the land but possibly wants to acquire it so this is that private firm is going to be the buyer so this will be a model of one buyer and many sellers here for simplicity i have put rj equal to 1 over n minus 1 but it need not be so there might be uh, you know positive uh, property rights for all the farmers which sum to 1 Okay, that uh, that is the only requirement so all those guys who have positive property rights they are the sellers and the guy who has zero property right and there is only one such guy uh, he, he is the buyer in this model okay so these are some of the examples i mean of course the paper uh, or the model is trying to abstract away from this particular example and just uh, trying to tell you what can you do for an arbitrary property right structure you'll see interesting corollaries for each of these uh, specific examples so we'll show that uh, you know these uh, the first kind of property right structure is very bad the second kind of property right structure is very good the third one may be good or may be bad it will depend on the particular uh, other specifics of the model okay so we'll see all these things and if you think of any other kind of property right structure which you think is uh, interesting in certain settings you know the the results are going to uh, say something on that also okay so what is a mechanism in this case uh, a mechanism is uh, basically uh, q and t capital q and t where q i is the share allocation rule of agent i and ti is the transfer rule for agent i this capital v is this uh, type space where let's assume that everybody is drawing from this uh, uh, common support zero to beta interval okay so that's your capital v is everybody has the same type okay and uh, same type space and uh, so this is capital v 
and the share allocation rule basically decides uh, how much share to give to each of the agents uh, at every possible uh, valuation profile, value profile, and similarly the payment rule. And a mechanism is feasible. Uh, so here I'm using feasibility slightly differently. Uh, so it's feasible if the you know the allocation rule is feasible. So everybody should be given a share less than equal to one. Okay, uh, I mean the sum of shares should be less than equal to one, and the transfers are budget balance. So sum of TIB is equal to zero at every profile. Okay, so we are going to explicitly impose this budget balance and uh, basically the uh, you can't allocate more shares than you have okay uh, so earlier i think in some of the earlier lectures whenever i said feasibility i meant that uh, the sum of transfers has to be uh, less than equal to zero but here it's uh, i'm going to say that uh, sum of transfers is equal to zero and the allocation rule itself is also feasible. Okay. And why we have not taken summation QI to be equal to one? Well, that will come automatically because we are going to impose efficiency, but uh, a general mechanism need not uh, satisfy that problem. Okay. So it will come automatically when we impose efficiency. So, but what happens if it's uh, strictly less than one? nothing happens i mean we are just allowing for that possibility okay but i'm trying to be more general than i need to be i mean basically in the next slide i'm going to impose uh, efficiency so uh, so that will mean that uh, i'll use a particular q function where i will just allocate to the entire share the one share to the agent who has the highest value so this q will play no role in uh, whatsoever. So you can just forget about Q in some sense. Okay. But I'm just trying to be general enough to start with. The other thing that you should keep in mind notationally here is that TI is the transfer rule, not the payment rule. So what it means is that uh, you should interpret this as the amount paid to agent I rather than the payment received from agent I. Okay. So this is a setting where we should think of this as a, you know, um, of course this TI can be negative also. So that means that some agents may, might be making payments, but um, TI can be, uh, you know, in general, I will just add TI, which means that if it is negative, then you're making payment to the designer. If it is positive, then the designer is paying. Okay, so incentive and participation constraints are Bayesian, so interim. So that's why we will worry about the interim uh, uh, terms. And uh, so here, what this is basically, uh, so this all this crazy notation is just saying is that uh, uh, there are some typos here, but what this is saying is that this is the expected allocation probability of agent i with type vi okay and similarly this is the expected payment uh, of uh, agent i with uh, type vi okay and uh, these things are basically the probabilities of uh, v minus i occurring because of independence and because everything is drawn from the same distribution f I'm just multiplying them and integrating it out. Okay, so that you don't have to worry about how these are computed. These are just uh, uh, expectations over V minus I, just like we did for Mars. Okay, and with these notations, we can define Bayesian incentive compatibility and in interim individual rationality. BIC, we already know that uh, every agent I, if he has a type VI, then it's expected the utility by reporting truthfully is greater than or equal to uh, what uh, its expected utility would be if he reported VI prime. Okay, so that's uh, truth telling is a Bayes Nash equilibrium, uh, but participation is slightly different. Uh, here, interim individual rationality means that. Uh, uh, the expected payoff from the mechanism is greater than or equal to RIVI. Okay, so this uh, this is where property rights play an important role. That uh, the agent 
uh, agent I with type VI will only participate in the mechanism if you promise to give him an expectation what he's getting now, which is RIVI. Okay. Uh, this is different from the optimal auction design setting IR, where we assume that uh, the outside options of the agents, the bidders in those models is zero. So there we just had this, this expected payoff is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Another way to think about it is like those were buy buyers. So they had zero property rights on the object. So this RI was zero for those guys. So that meant that this is greater than or equal to zero. But here, not every agent will be a buyer, right? So some people would have property rights. So in that case, uh, you know, in, you will have, uh, you know, the general version of that would be this, the IR constraint. Okay, so we'll call this the interim individual rationality constraint in this case. Okay, so, so what do we mean by a partnership can be dissolved efficiently? Well, a partnership can be dissolved efficiently if there exists a feasible way, which feasible meaning that uh, allocation feasibility and budget balance as was defined here. Okay, uh, so, uh, sorry, here. Okay, there is a feasible, efficient means that highest valued agent gets the object, Bayesian incentive compatible, and interim individually rational mechanism for this partnership. Okay, so in, we need to satisfy these four properties. Okay. So of course, uh, because the model, everything distributions and everything is uh, similar to Myerson, we can immediately involve, uh, invoke uh, Myerson's uh, BIC characterization of uh, 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 that we studied earlier. So we know that a mechanism QT is uh, Bayesian incentive compatible if and only if for every I in N, QI is non-decreasing. So this is my uh, interim allocation probability that should be non-decreasing and this uh, payment, you know, payoff equivalence or revenue equivalence formula holds, which is basically the difference in payments, uh, expected payments at uh, two types is equal to something which only depends on QI. Okay, so it, it's uh, some function of QI and that just follows, uh, you know, uh, by showing that uh, the interim utility function is convex and every uh, the qi is the subgradient of that and hence uh, uh, we just write uh, convex function as a direct integral of the subgradient and so that's basically follows from that okay so this if and only if uh, by now i hope you are very comfortable with uh, the only uh, difference here is that in the earlier, uh, you know, Myerson's case, I was always taking this VI prime to be zero. Okay, so I was taking, uh, you know, I was writing this as TI VI equal to TI zero plus something, 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 right? Here, I'm just taking some arbitrary VI prime and writing it like that. It, uh, does not matter. You can, uh, this is the same as writing it at zero. So it's, it's all the same. Okay. Let's keep this in mind. So we are going to come back and use this, uh, 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 you know, to uh, analyze the dissolution mechanism also. So let's keep this in mind. And one advantage that we have is by definition, we will only be interested in efficient mechanisms. Okay. So if you're only interested in efficient mechanisms, then uh, we have a very good sense of how the efficient mechanism works. Uh, basically, we uh, an agent I wins if all other agents have type less than that particular agent. Okay, that's basically the uh, rule. But what is the probability with which uh, all other agents have uh, type less than VI? Well, F of VI is the probability that uh, any agent other than agent I has a value less than vi 
and there are n minus one such agents. So for agent I to win, all of them have must have value less than B I, and everything is independent. So the total probability that uh, agent I with type B I wins is f of B I to the power n minus one. So we are going to denote that as G of B I, okay? And note that capital G is also a distribution probability distribution function, okay? Uh, with a density equal to n minus one times f V I to the power n minus two, okay? So G is a. Shouldn't it be multiplied by small f V I also? Which one? Last expression. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I missed that. Thanks, thanks. This should be multiplied by small f of bi. That's true. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Okay. So with uh, with the density n minus one f of bi to the power n minus two small f of bi. Okay. So this is the probability with which agent i with type bi wins the object, and hence small qi bi of the efficient allocation rule is just G of V I, okay. Capital G of V I is the interim allocation probability of any. So that's a uh, you know major simplification, and because uh, throughout the lectures we are just going to use the efficient mechanism because that's what uh, we will be interested in. So um, interim allocation probabilities are all going to be uh, you know uh, G of V I, okay. That's what it is. Okay. Right, and uh, so so uh, so uh, what we know is that uh, in the Myerson uh, uh, models, the interim payoff of the lowest type is the lowest, right? So the interim payoff, the UI function here, is not only convex but also non-decreasing. So the lowest type gets the lowest payoff. The highest type gets low, uh, highest payoff, and so on. So that comes from basically incentive compatibility constraints. Okay. So what? Uh, uh, but here, remember, uh, you know, an agent from the mechanism will get this payoff, but he's already getting RIVI as the uh, payoff from property rights. So the marginal payoff that he will get from participating in the mechanism. Is UI VI minus RI VI. So this is the difference in payoff by participating in the mechanism. Okay, so remember uh, individual rationality here says that this marginal payoff is greater than or equal to zero. So we are more interested in this marginal payoff rather than UI VI itself. Okay, so of course, if UI is convex, this function is also convex. But uh, notice that UI is increasing uh, or non-decreasing, but this part uh, is also non uh, non-decreasing or increasing. So this whole thing, you know, it it need not be uh, monotone in the usual sense. Okay, so it, it continues to be uh, convex, but you know the minimum of this term need not occur at VI equal to zero. Okay. So that's what this uh, lemma is saying that if you take an efficient and Bayesian incentive compatible mechanism, then the point at which uh, the minimum of this will occur is basically this uh, type VI star, where this VI star is the type at which G of VI star is equal to RI. Okay? So what it means is that uh, take the type at which you're entering allocation probability is exactly your property rights okay that's where you will get the lowest possible marginal payoff okay so this uh, lemma is saying that uh, for any type vi the marginal payoff of vi is greater than or equal to the marginal payoff from v star r okay so marginal payoff is minimized at V star i. So if you were to think about it pictorially, this function is a convex function. Okay, it's like some U-shaped type of function. 
but the minimum need not be at zero, but exactly at uh, uh, V star i. Okay, so that basically just follows from the you know first order conditions of this. That's it basically. Okay, so if you uh, you know if you differentiate this, uh, we know that U i's derivative is equal to what? What is the derivative of U i? Wherever it is differentiable. Right, so, so we know from Myerson that uh, uh, for every Bayesian incentive compatible mechanism, uh, the utility uh, net interim utility functions uh, derivative is equal to the interim allocation probability wherever it is differentiable. Okay, so the derivative of ui is exactly equal to qi. Okay, so that means that the first order condition of this will be qi vi minus ri equal to zero. Okay, so what is qi vi? What is qi vi given that capital G vi? Capital G vi, right? Because q is efficient. So we just learned from the last slide that qi vi is equal to G vi. So the first order condition of this exactly gives you that the minimum occurs at that vi where g of vi is equal to ri. That's what this lemma is saying. Okay. Okay, so the next lemma is basically giving you the characterization of interim individual rationality. So again, recall from the Myerson's uh, case that uh, 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 if a mechanism is Bayesian incentive compatible, then is it, it is interim individual rational if and only if the expected payment of the lowest time is less than or equal to zero, okay? Because there the payment was the payment given by the agent and here it is payment received by the agent. If we translate it to this word, it's basically going to say that it is IIR if and only if the expected payment received by the agent is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Well, here the only difference is the lowest type is not the type which has the lowest payoff, lowest marginal payoff. The lowest marginal payoff is received by the V star I agent. So accordingly, this uh, IIR characterization basically changes a little bit. Now IIR is equivalent to requiring that TI V star I is greater than or equal to zero for all I, where V star I, as we saw, is G V star I equal to R. Okay. So uh, take an efficient and BIC mechanism. Such a mechanism satisfies interim individual rationality if and only if this V star I agent receives non-negative payoff, uh, non-negative payment, okay? So it receives non-negative payment, okay? So again, the proof follows immediately from what we saw here. Notice that uh, this is my IR constraint is basically saying that this has to be greater than or equal to zero. But this is equivalent to requiring that the, this type is, has, uh, 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 this particular term is greater than or equal to zero. And that's basically what it is saying. Okay, if you expand that term, this term, then you basically get this using g of v star i equal to ri, you immediately get that ti v star i is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so that's what it is equivalent. So can you please explain this part again? Okay, so, so let's do the proof carefully. So let's uh, do one direction, which is to say that suppose it is interim individually rational, then we must have ti v star i is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, let's try to prove that. Okay, you can try to do the other direction on your own. Okay, so 
So we take a mechanism which is efficient, BIC and interim individually rational because it satisfies all these three properties. The earlier lemma basically says that this equation holds. Okay. Now we know that it is interim individually rational, which means that the lowest type, okay, which is uh, are the type with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the type having value V star i must also have greater than or equal to zero payoff. Okay. So, so that means that what is its um, uh, individual rationality constraint? It's ui v star i must be greater than or equal to ri v star i, right? So if you remember IIR was basically saying that utility of the agent must be greater than ri v i. So this applies to v star i agent also. So if you apply it, it basically says that ui v star i minus ri v star i is greater than or equal to zero. But then, uh, what is that uh, expression here? So if you expand ui v star i, ui v star i is this, because qi v star i is equal to g v star i. We know that because it's efficient. And this is the payment ti v star i minus ri v star i. And by definition, this is equal to ri. So this and this cancels. So we are left with Ti V star i. And because it is interim individual rational, this whole thing is greater than or equal to zero. So that means that Ti V star i is greater than or equal to zero. That's what we are requiring. Okay. The other direction basically says that if Ti V star i is greater than or equal to zero, then IIR holds. Well, if Ti V star i is greater than or equal to zero, then this is greater than or equal to zero. But if this is greater than or equal to zero, then every VI also, the marginal payoff is greater than or equal to zero. But that's exactly what IIR constraint is. Okay? Yes. So we have, so far what we have done is redone Myerson in this world. Okay, so we have taken the, uh, uh, what we knew in Myerson's world, we have just translated it here because the individual rationality constraints were slightly translated, slightly different. Okay, so we have just redone that. Uh, so what uh, Crampton, Gibbons, and Klemperer do is that uh, use these two observations, these two lemmas, to completely describe the RIs which can be dissolved efficiently. So their main result is the following: that a partnership uh, a partnership is basically this, uh, you know, a share vector R1 to Rn with sum to 1 can be dissolved efficiently. That is, there exists a, a BIC efficient budget balance and interim individually rational mechanism if and only if these Ri's satisfy this inequality. Now, this inequality, you know, before thinking about what this is and how complicated it is, let's first verify that what are the parameters involved in this inequality. Well, first the parameter involved are capital F and small g. Remember F is the prior of the model and g comes from this uh, capital G, which is F of x to the power n minus one. So small g of x is n minus 1 f of x to the power n minus 2 small f of x. Okay. So this is the distribution of the highest of the n minus 1 agents. Okay. So this is the density of that. Okay. So all these terms are basically coming from the prior. Okay. Nothing else. Where is Ri picturing in? Well, Ri is picturing in, in this v star i, which is there in this limits of this integral. Okay, so why is that? Because we know by our earlier definition that uh, g of v star i is equal to r i or v star i is equal to g inverse of r i. Okay, that's where r i's are figuring in. Okay, right. So, so this inequality is basically saying that, uh, you know, certain expression must be 
greater than or equal to zero. Uh, the good thing about this is, uh, you know, it you don't need to actually think of a mechanism which can dissolve this partnership without because the remember the question is does there exist a BIC efficient budget balance and interim individually rational mechanism? This is not saying how that mechanism will look. It's just saying, it's just giving an existential result that yes, it exists if and only if this inequality holds, which involves terms from RI and the distribution. So beta is the upper limit of the type space. Uh, okay. So remember types are distributed between zero and beta. So that's the upper limit and capital F, small g, and this is uh, B star, right? So it's some complicated condition involving F and Ri and uh, beta, but it is a complete characterization. So if you have a computer program which can compute the value of this expression for every Ri, you know, partnership structure, uh, and for every prior, then basically somebody ask you, well, we have this partnership, can we dissolve it efficiently or not? Well, if this expression is greater than or equal to zero, yes. Otherwise, no. Okay, so uh, what will be more interesting is like, we'll have many interesting corollaries. And the is there any characterization of this equation one? Characterization in the sense any intuitive meaning? Uh -huh, so, uh, so we will do the proof. In the proof, you will uh, get a sense of what that uh, uh, expression is saying. So it's going to be some, uh, uh, you know, some bound on the expected uh, payment collected by the mechanism. Okay, so that's uh, what it is. Uh, and so, the, so wait till we do the proof, and you will get a sense of what it is. And basically, uh, the interesting corollaries will basically say that. Uh, for certain RIs, okay, so for certain partnerships, we are definitely sure that this expression is non-negative. Okay, these expressions are going to be definitely non-negative for some partnerships. For some partnerships, we, we are definitely sure that this uh, expression is negative. Okay, so these will be the interesting results. But uh, there will be a bunch of partnerships for which this expression can be positive or can be negative it will depend on capital F and G. G of course depends on F, so it depends on capital F. <coughs> but for certain partnership structures, independent of what F is, this inequality will always be satisfied. And for certain partnership structure, independent of what F is, it will always not satisfy. Okay, so those will be the interesting corollaries, but the result itself is uh, is quite uh, remarkable because it completely describes all the partnerships that can be dissolved efficiently. Okay, so from the next class, I'll carry on with the proof of this. I'll stop here. Um, so what i want you to do is from today and the next class is uh, you know you need to be familiar with these uh, myerson uh, and so on to be able to appreciate this thing so for instance uh, uh, if i ask you like uh, if you this is the interim payoff what is the derivative of ui vi it should come immediately to you if you are not able to imagine that quickly at this point then uh, there's no point going forward because everything depends on knowing all these things you know otherwise you just get lost so i'll uh, suggest that before we do the proof uh, you brush up what we have learned in myerson and so on and if required uh, send me an email and we can talk tomorrow also if there is any talk okay. so in the next lecture i will do the proof of this uh, uh, theorem and we'll uh, uh, you know basically have many corollaries like this so so those these corollaries are basically more interesting uh, results and and, and
and we'll discuss this. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, I will uh, update the slides and uh, there are some typos and all and uh, I will upload the video. I'll send you the updated slide immediately. So take a look, okay? Okay? Okay, sir. Thank you.